am talking about end times. What's going to happen in the end? Jesus is coming back. That's the truth. He's coming back. It's not, a, it's not an if, it's a when, right? And we talked about, just by way of review a little bit, we talked about, you know, we, we sort of tend to live like we're at 1030 in the morning in our life. But when in reality, biblically speaking, we're more like at 1030 at night. And so we want to continue with that. And the word of God begins right from the book of Genesis to lay out and describe the plan that God set in motion for those that he loves, right? What was going to happen? So um, we had this... Um, we have this, un- we, we have this uh, what do I want to say, this habit as, as humans to get, fo- and this is n- natural, right, it, to get focused and sort of hung up and wrapped up in our own life. And, and we, 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 don't, we don't remember the urgency. And we sort of forget, look, Jesus is coming back. It's going to end. And that's not to say, <laughs> that's not to say, well, I'm, you know what? I'm going in tomorrow morning. I'm going to tell my boss off. I'm going to, because Jesus is coming back, who cares? No, no, don't do that, because I don't know what the time frame looks like. And that's our text, and will be, will continue to be, is that no man knows the day or the hour or the time. And when somebody begins to guess, when somebody begins to say, oh, we think it'll be September of 2000, listen, as soon as you hear something like that, run. Turn it off, leave, because for somebody to make that statement puts them in a position of pride and arrogance, and they're mistaken, they're wrong right from the word go. Why? Because not even Jesus knows yet. Do you understand that? Uh, wait, now, now you're throwing me. So most of you have heard this before. Some of you haven't. Jesus and the angels do not know yet when God is going to say, go, now, right now, go. That's... That's like, it's interesting, because I was taught to, you know, you, you think about the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're three in one. Don't they all know each other's every thought? Evidently not, because they are three individuals. They're so unified that they're one entity in three parts. But they're really three individual entities that are so together they're one. Don't hurt yourself. Don't think about this too long. But the truth is, for somebody to say, hey, I, I've done all the research and, and Jesus is coming back this year in September. Hogwash. Hogwash. Be careful. Be careful what you listen to. That doesn't mean that prophecy isn't real. The Bible, the scripture's full, full of, of prophecy that talks about when Jesus is going to come back. And the question that I asked last week, and I'm going to ask it again now, is does that make you happy or does that make you nervous? That was the question that we'll, po- that we'll continue to pose today, last week, next week, week after. The question is, we know that Jesus is coming back. Does that excite you? Does it make you feel good? Or does it make you feel anxious? Does it make you feel nervous? Does it make you think, I don't know that I'm ready quite. Or, or there were some things I really wanted to get done. Now, I don't know about you, but timing uh, is important to me. Time is important to me. If something starts at 10, I'm there at 9.30. If something, now, <laughs> see, it, should I, I shouldn't bash my wife. I love her dearly, and she's gotten so much better. But when we first got married, listen, if something started at 10, quarter after 10 was on time. And I'm like, no, 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 I, I have OCD in that way. And she's gotten so much better, believe me. And so uh, time is important. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's of the essence. And it means something. And God gave us time. God gave us time, not so that he could plan his calendar, because he doesn't think like we do, but so that he could create in me an understanding of urgency. Had he not given us an understanding of what time is, he wouldn't have been able to create in me an understanding of, now that I know what time is, it's running out. And Jesus is coming back, right? It's for me. Let me read real quick. So are you excited or are you dreading it? Here we go. We're going to read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. It says this, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. I don't need to tell you, right? For you yourselves are already fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. 
While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come on them like labor pains come on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness. He's talking to believers now. But you're not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. And so I'm paraphrasing now. So you've got nothing to be worried about. Because when you start preaching about end times, people get real nervous. Oh my word, the world's all ending. What do we do? No, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. It doesn't matter. Come what may. Listen, this is the, this is absolutely the truth. I look around and think, wow, things seem to be getting worse. And yet I've never felt more at peace with the Lord. And yet I've never felt more of a sense of confidence of what Christians ought to be doing when we're doing it. Not everybody, I, and that's why we urge people to, to kind of wake up, but there's a, there's a great giant mass of believers in this planet that are serving the Lord, and they're honoring him, and they're doing what we're supposed to be doing, right? So even if I see things getting worse, I also say, you know what? But God knows that it is getting worse, and so there's much more grace than there used to be, right? Where sin abounds, what abounds even more? Grace, the understanding, the understanding, the knowledge that God says, yeah, I know how bad it's getting. I'm getting more people. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. We need more people. We need more. I'm going to save more. So things to watch for is what we started this, right? It was things to watch for. So we talked about this last week. The first two was the continual. The first one was the continual decline of morality. That was number one, the thing to watch for, the continued decline of morality. Listen, man, there is a gender confusion in this country. It's sad. It's preposterous. I'm sorry. These aren't my words. The word of God is very clear. He made a man a man and a woman a woman. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to offend. I love people. The, there might be somebody that has, that, that has an opinion that homosexuality is okay or what have you. Listen to me. The word of God is the word of God. I don't get to choose. I don't get to determine, I like that verse, I like that verse, but I don't like that verse. Now, does that mean I'm better than them in some way? No. Does it mean that I should treat them in a certain way? No. Does it not mean that I should love them and and, and befriend them and have relationship with them? Why? So I can draw them to Jesus just the same way as anybody else. I'm reading this article this week, and there's this dude who's decided he is neither male, he is not female, he's not human. Have you seen this? He's had like 30, 40 different cosmetic surgeries to make himself look like an alien. I'm not kidding. I don't know if you saw it or not, and I'm like, is this a joke? Is this a parody? I'm reading, I'm waiting for like the punchline. There's no punchline. You know, and you've seen these things, and, I, and listen, I'm not hating on them. I'm not, I'm not hating on them. Listen, in the end times, people will be very confused because the spirit of this age wants them confused, right? I told you, I love my sons. I don't want to create in them an understanding that it's, I don't want them to, I don't want to create in my sons an understanding that they're better than anyone else or anything like that. So it's always about grace and it's about mercy and it's about love. But if I see them, and they're watching a cartoon that's trying to blur the issue, I will point it out to them immediately, and I say, do you see what they're trying to do? They're trying to make it seem like that's normal. That's not. It's sin. It's wrong. It's the same way as when somebody's speaking the wrong way or doing the wrong thing. Wrong is wrong, and right is right. But the further we come to the end of the age, the more God says this, the more more man and woman will say, good is bad, and bad is good. That's what the Bible says. It says that men will call good evil, and they'll call evil good and so that was all last week still reviewing perhaps I should move on to today's but it's something that just bothers me this gender confusion this gender junk and even the racial even the racial junk even the racial junk listen let me go on record right now there is nothing that a Christian has any right to ever look at any other human being and consider yourself in any way better worse inferior superior it doesn't ex- it shouldn't exist in the Christianity in in, in, in in the Christianity my brother and my sister are exactly the same as me God created that diversity I did not and there's no and there listen this is not a political statement I'm not making a political statement. I don't care who's in office. I don't care before. I prayed for the previous administration. I'll pray for the current administration. I'll pray for the next one. Doesn't matter to me. That's not what we're talking about right now. I'm talking about uh, racial equality in the eyes of a Christian. Nothing should ever make a Christian say, well, you know how those people are. God forgive you and God forgive me. And some of you are smirking because it's happened to you. 
Listen, I was raised in Reading. Reading was almost 95% Hispanic. I've, I've shared this with you before. When I went through school, I looked Hispanic, and they were like, are you Puerto Rican? And I was like, yep, absolutely. Why? Because I'm like, I'm not getting beat up. Right? There was a, but, but over time, listen, as a kid, we came here from Italy. Already I had like stuff stacked against me because we were trying to get rid of our accent and this and that. The point is, the point is I, I didn't realize, I didn't realize what that whole racial tension was until I was grown and away from Reading. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. That's interesting. And it's sad and it's demonic. Listen, if the devil wants to, and this is his tactic, if the devil wants to get in the church and split us up so that he can succeed, how much more do you think he's going to use politics and media? Oh, the media is demonic. It's demonic. All of it. But listen, let me get this straight. Get this straight reality in the world around us is not what you see on the media because the, portray the portrayals that they feed you are not accurate and they are not realistic so before you say look how bad it is or look how terrible it is do keep in mind do keep in mind God is still on the throne are there real issues there yes there sure are but is it as bad as the media paints it's never accurate if you watch the media. Why? Because they want to paint a certain picture. They want to paint a certain portrayal. It is not, stop looking there if you're looking there for your awareness. Stop, don't, don't lose sleep. I, I watch the news once in a while, once in a while. It's good to be informed. It's not good to believe what you see. It's just not, it's just not. So that was what we looked at last week, the morality, the, d the decline that's happening, and it's true. And number second thing that we looked at was there's a complete shift in superpowers. A complete shift in superpowers. Who has nuclear weapons today that didn't? Who has dirty bombs? Who has chemical, who's, who has access to chemical warfare? All of that. It's a different landscape than it was even 10 years ago, even five years ago. It continues to change, so we know that. The, the Word of God talks about powers that are going to shift, right? And we looked at that last week. So let's go on. Before Jesus comes back, here we go. Number three. I'm only going to cover a couple more today. Number three. What we're going to see is the rise of 10 European nations in an, in, into an international superpower. Listen, I'm not, I, 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 I don't just pull this stuff out of the air. I, I read articles. I've read other sermons. I've read other books. I read the scriptures themselves. I've read through it. I've talked to people. This is not, this is not guesswork. Some of it, some of it you can say, well, I'm not sure exactly how something's going to happen. But scripture's pretty clear in what it paints for us. So that number three, the thing for us to watch for to understand, yeah, we're in end time. We're in the last days. Jesus is coming back. And that matters. I don't care how old I am or how young I am. Jesus is coming back. And, and nothing that I was worried about tomorrow, yesterday, today, none of that will matter when Jesus comes back. So this does matter, but the rise of 10 European nations into an international superpower will, will happen before Christ comes back. It'll be north of Jerusalem, probably. It's referred to as the last resurrection of the Holy Roman Empire. They think that it will be a Roman power that these 10 nations come together at. And collectively, these 10 nations are called the beast in the book of Revelation. Now, understand this. There is also an individual that will be referred to as the beast. He's referred to as the beast as well. So don't get confused. It's why I don't preach on this much, because you can get lost in this stuff a little bit. So the beast refers to this 10-nation creature. This beast is talked about in Daniel. It's talked about in Revelations. And it's got, it's got descriptions. It's got the mouth of a lion, etc. Ten horns, all of this, right? Seven heads. And and, and so, it's, it's, these, are the ten, these are the ten countries that it'll be. Which countries? Exactly. I don't know. I don't know exactly which countries they are, but it will be after the decline of democracy in Europe. And in case you've been paying attention at all, it's a mess. It's a mess here. It's a mess there. Nothing to worry about. I, gotta be, I have to keep saying this. As a Christian, this is not meant to make you go... <gasps> What's he saying? All is well. God is on the throne. This is supposed to happen. This is supposed to happen. I can walk out the door tomorrow morning of my house confident, at peace. I can sleep sweetly. Listen, whatever happens, God is in charge. He, he will keep you. He will keep you. He'll sustain you. We're not to worry about this stuff. I need to say that because I, can, I sort of feel people going, 
Oh, really? It's a mess? It's a mess here? It's a mess in Europe? Ah! You know, don't run screaming for the doors. There's no need. But it is true that it's going to happen after the decline of democracy in Europe, and it will probably be a strong German influence. Why? Because it talks about the countries that have gained power and lost power. And if you look at Europe, that's how it appears at the moment, right? The rise of the beast and the power in Europe is the fifth trumpet in Revelation. It's talked about. Let's go, in fact, go there if you want. Chapter 17 in the book of Revelations, verses 12 to 13, so that we can just describe this. And you'll, you'll hear it. And here's what it says. Revelations chapter 17, verses 12 and 13 says this. The ten horns which you saw... Right? God is describing this to John. He's trying to express to him, John, this is what you saw. This is what it means. The ten horns which you saw are, te are, are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they will receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. When it happens, it's not exactly 60 minutes. That one hour, it signifies an amount of time. We're going to look at that later. For one hour is a short period of time. So these 10 leaders are going to band together, probably the European Union. Now, right now, the European Union has like something between 20 and 30 countries, and it fluctuates, right? It'll change. It'll go backwards and forwards, and sometimes they add, and, 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 and that's the case. But by the time this happens, I think Great Britain, other countries will abdicate. Anyway, long story short, there will be 10 countries that make this up. I didn't say that. He did, because it's 10 horns. And those are the 10 kings it's describing that don't have power until the beast gets Gives it to them, right? Verse 13. These are, and he's describing who these are now, who the ten are. Verse 13. These are of one mind, and, <clears throat> and they will give their power and authority to the beast, right? So here are these ten nations that work together, and we're describing the nations as a beast itself, as a creature. But the beast, this na these nations, give their power and their authority to one guy, and then he's called the beast, right? And these ten nations give their sovereignty to somebody who's going to be very charismatic. He's going to be an autocratic type of dictator, meaning no democracy. He's in charge. But here's the thing that's going to delude the people. The people will be so sad, so upset, so desperate, so unhappy at how horrible society has become that they're going to love this guy. They're going to be thrilled to death that he comes in and rescues them. We can predict it, we, can be, we can predict that it'll be because democracy fails. Now, will that be because of Islam? Maybe. Would it be a health thing? Maybe. Whatever. It's, something's going to collapse to the degree that makes them say, somebody save us. And out comes this guy, and they're going to call on him. So what's the beast? It's a sh this, this, this end time empire is basically a, a, an entity that Satan's going to rule and empower. The beast will cause this human dictator literally to be worshipped worldwide. He's going to become very possible uh, very popular and all of that revelation chapter 13 says this revelation chapter 13 says satan will transform the political military power into even a great religious crusade the lines are going to be blurred the lines are going to be blurred it's the same beast as it's talked about in revelations 13 3 i'll read it revelations 13 3 and i saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed you know what that means? It means the guy will all but die, possibly even die, and will be brought back. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Listen, I'm not making this up. The word of God says that Satan is given power, is given power. He has the authority to do some crazy things, and he's going to do something that makes the whole world go, oh, wow. So it's not just going to be militarily and politically that this guy gains power, it's going to be spiritual because people are going to look and they're going to say, what must be the real thing? Must be the real thing because they're blinded to what God is doing and to where God is. So this is talking about an actual revival or resurrection or healing of this earlier beast. Uh, and, and it's also talking about this awakening of a Roman empire that's going to come back. Verse 4 says this in verse 4, so they worshipped the dragon, that's Satan, who gave authority to the beast. That's both the countries and the man. And they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So there's a spiritual element. The guy will be an idol, worshiped that way. There's a military element. He'll be a great politician, a great military leader. It's, it's all of that. Verse 5, it, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. That's the hour. 
Remember what I said earlier, that the nations are going to be given power and authority for a certain season of time. That's the time. 42 months is that brief time that they're going to be given this power. Verse 6 to 7 says this, Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. This is a worldwide dictatorship that you see forming in this scripture. Verse 8, listen, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names, listen, this is so, this is huge, this is very important. Whose name, they will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life. Remember what I said earlier, this isn't cause for me to panic, why? Because I know that I've given my heart to Jesus and my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. This is nothing for me to worry about, it is for me to look around myself and go, wow, wow, it's happening. It's happening. I see it happening. Countries that would have been blowing each other off the map 20 years ago are bosom buddies today. Arm in arm trying to figure out how do we destroy Jerusalem? How do we destroy Israel? Things that were happening years ago, you would never have dreamed of things that have fallen into place and slotted right into where God said they were going to slot. All right, let me move on whose names have not been written in the book of life, that is the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So it's only those who are truly uh, called and converted, converted and following God that will not worship the beast. Now listen to me very clearly. There's this argument, and there's not enough time to do this like in, in as detailed a manner as I would like to, uh, because we only have so many weeks to, dedicated to this series. But there is a question of the tribulation that's coming. We know that bad things are going to happen. So the question is, are the Christians gone by then? Listen, you could be pre-trib, you could be mid-trib, you could be post-trib. What does that mean? What does any of that mean? It means that I believe that we will be gone, that the Christians will already not be here during the tribulation. We, I believe in pre-trib. There's a lot of scripture that points to it. In fact, the Assemblies of God has that stance. There are some that point to mid-trib, and there's some, there's some validity to that because of the things that are going on today. And people are saying, well, how do you know we're not in the tribulation? Well, in part, we might be, in part. But I know that the things described in Scripture have not yet happened the way they're described. It's going to be crazy. And I believe that Christians will be gone by then. And I'm certainly not post-trib. I'm certainly not post-trib simply for verses just like this one that indicate, listen, they're going to worship him whose name is not written down in the book of life. But if your name is written down in the book of life, when Jesus comes back, you're going with him. Now, we're not even at the millennial reign. We're not going to get into that in this series, but we will talk about that eventually. Anyway, verse 9 at the end of these verses, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. What does that mean? God is saying, pay attention. Pay attention. Watch what's happening. It's not a joke. It's a warning. So we watch. We watch for this unification of the European Union. We watch for these 10 powerful nations with, with the world's largest economy that eventually dominates the U.S. and the rest of the world. I need you to know this is well underway. I don't know how much of this you read or how much of it you watch. I avoid the news, but I do pay attention. And I read, what I, I read most of my stuff, and I go online, and I, I take everything that I see in the media with a grain of salt, but I do see what's happening overseas. I have relatives there. I have family in Italy and England and all over, and we do talk, and we do see what's happening. So it's not, there's no question. There's no question that things are happening, and there's some kind of, some kind of collapse is going to come. It is. And when people give up their freedom to this leader because they say, we need a rescuer, that's that's when it will be, it'll be because they're terrified. And they may even think it's a good thing at first when the guy appears on the scene. So the current status in Europe right now, uh, just so you understand, the European Union already has a single market. You, you, you've, you know what a euro is, right? Uh, there, a number of years ago, I, you know, we, we've traveled quite a bit. I, came from, I was born there, but uh, we've gone back to Italy several times, been there quite a bit. And I remember when they stopped using the lira and went to the euro. And I thought, wow, that's crazy. This is a while ago now. But Italy and some other, many other countries, they, 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 they're all, they've adopted one currency. It's not like we're far from there being a one world government either. We're not far from any of this. 
So there's a monetary union, and they call it the Eurozone. See, in, in the European Union is made up of all of these countries, but they have not all adopted the Euro. The ones that have adopted the Euro are the ones in the Eurozone, the ones that have already literally transferred their economy over to this European Union, this entity that's already kind of a juggernaut. Bigger, bigger more powerful, more, and, and, and wealthier than China, the U.S., all of it. It's a big deal. Years... 20 years ago, they would have said never, not in a million years. Now, it's already there. It's, it's in place, right? In 2010, the EU was already considered, 2010, seven years ago, the EU was already considered the biggest economy in the world. That kind of shocked me. Ten, like, I, I, wouldn't, I didn't realize, I, I realized, but the enormity of the biggest economy in the world seven years ago was already, I would have thought China, India, you know, places that are hugely, enormously populated. It's not the case. It's already the European Union. It's the largest exporter. It's the largest importer of goods, services, all of it. Trade, biggest partner to several countries, including the U.S. and China and all of those, India. And at, at some point, it looked like France was going to lead the charge. But honestly, France got chewed up and spit out by who islam if you drive through france it's like going through the middle east in many sections of it that's why the power has gone to uh, most of the power has gone to germany why why would god let this happen i'll tell you why because the world's going to need a reason to need a rescuer and i think this will be the reason I could be wrong. Some of this is conjecture, but I do know what scripture says. I do know that there's no question that it'll be a 10 country power. Journalists, media, everybody is basically recognized that Germany is sort of taking center stage in that. So you watch for the other countries. Listen, when you see other countries start to fall out of the union, you can, you can, get, you can get even more nervous, not in a bad way. You need to pray even more. When you see countries starting to fall out of the union, you can say, wow, they're going to a 10 country power right now. You can see it happening. And there are already countries do, that are doing that. Uh, England refuses to take, to, to take on the euro. They've kept their pound and all of, there's a bunch of, there's a lot of, de there's so much detail. There's not time to do this right now, right? But, but it does matter and they will end up with these nations and we read about it in Daniel and Revelations. In Daniel, it's about a 10-toed a ten statue. In Revelations, of course, it's this 10-horned uh, beast and there's, it's very clear that there's 10 nations involved, right? So what else is on the horizon? Number four, there will be this huge power, right? There's this 10-nation this nation superpower that, that's born and this beast that's called, it, it, it'll, be, it'll be this guy and these nations and it'll be, it'll be the beast, right? And this creature that's described in scripture. But there's also in scripture described a prominence of something, of something called the great whore. That's a horrible thing to think about, I understand. It, it's, not for the, it's not for the faint of heart, but the revelation, the revelation talks about a great whore. Who is that? It's a church. It's a church. Who are they describing? Listen, I am not here to offend today. I'm here to share the word of God. But you got to understand, it says what it says. And you can read between the lines and see what it says, right? But the number four, the thing to watch out for is the prominence of a powerful church over this European superpower. As powerful as these nations are, and as powerful as this dictator will be, whatever the Antichrist, whatever this beast chooses to do, or whatever that is, it says that the great harlot will ride the beast. Meaning what? Meaning they will literally be doing things together. They will be enmeshed like this. Revelation refers, refers, less, refers to it not just as the great whore, but as the mother of all harlots. And the leader, the, the leader of the false prophet. Why? Why is that? Why would you call it that? Because it, it's, it's an entity, whatever church, it's an entity that has traded value and truth of what God is and sold it for something different. That's the definition of a harlot. It's the definition of a prostitute to take something precious and pure and sell it for something else, right? Revelation chapter 17 verse 4 is where we would turn for this. Revelation 17, 4 and 5, here's what it says. The woman, and of course the woman represents a church. That's what it represents, the church, in, in scripture and in prophecy. And in this case, it's representing a false church. But the woman, or the false church, was arrayed, listen, in purple and scarlet. Purple and scarlet. Folks, I'm, I'm about to make you a little nervous. I don't want to offend anybody. Those are the official colors of the Vatican. Always have been purple and scarlet. I'm not making this up. This is in scripture. It's the word of God. And adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. The Vatican's the wealthiest entity in the world. There's nothing more wealthy. There's nothing more hidden. There's nothing with, without as much power and wealth as the Vatican. It's terrifying. 
And I'm not even going to get into World War II and the Jesuits that trained up Nazis and, and all of this. Listen, I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm not trying to make anybody uh, pick sides or, or, or walk to your neighbor and say, you're Catholic, you're, you're demonic. It's not what we're trying to do here. You need to understand the scripture says what it says. I'm not saying it. Scripture is saying it. And it says, having in her hand... This creature, this woman, this church, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. That's scary. Really, really scary. This is not about, you know, worshiping Mary is not acceptable. It's not okay. It's not scriptural. That's not, but that's not what we're talking We're not even talking about theology right now. We're talking about something altogether else. Verses 6 and 7. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Do you know how many thousands and thousands and thousands of people have been killed over the years in the name of the Inquisition? In the name of, and I'm not, listen, please, just, just bear with me. This is what scripture says. When I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. But the angel who's describing all this to John, I don't know how his head didn't just pop right off, but the angel that was describing it said to me, why are you shocked? Why do you marvel? What are you surprised about? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her. Remember what I said, the church and the European Union will be together. The Va and, and I do believe it's the Vatican. I do. I do see that. And which has, it says, the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. So the ten horns or the ten toes from the book of Daniel, whichever one you're looking at at the time. The revival of the Roman Empire in the end time will have this church riding on it, led by this false prophet. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And as I said, um, the truth is, you know, I, I have relatives, I have family who, who would look at me and say, you know, you call yourself Italian, you're not even Catholic. Look, we left Catholicism a long time ago. I'm, please, do not get offended with me. I am not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. The reason we left was the theological reasons. You do not pray rosary beads. The word of God says very clearly, avoid vain repetition. You do not pay someone. You do not pay someone to offer you forgiveness. You don't ask someone to give you penance. Now, there's, there's, is there a place for us to confess one to another? Yes, there is, but not so that person redeems you. That person's not forgiving you. You make yourself accountable to that person and they're accountable to you so that you can bless each other and help you other. But there's only one mediator between God and man. Folks, this is big stuff. It's not, it's not as I said, I don't want to offend, but this is what the word of God says. All right. The Vatican made this quote, this is a number of years ago, just in keeping again with the fact that they've aligned themselves and set themselves up to be part of this one world system. This is a quote directly from a journalist who's in the Vatican, says, the, the world political authority, the, the Vatican's been calling for the creation of a world political authority with powers to regulate all financial ec and economic markets. That's a big deal. That's a huge deal. And this is another published statement from the Vatican a couple years ago, a supranational authority is needed to place the common good at the center of international economic activity. You're the church. Why are you talking about that? That's got nothing to do with you. Preach Jesus. You're the church. But that's not what they are. Again, please, what does that sound like? What does it sound like? What do the quotes sound like? Well, it sounds very much like they're getting ready to do a one world government, which the scripture says is going to happen. Right? There's no question. They want common religion as well. They want a common religion element as well. Revelation 17 that we just read talks about this woman, that's, uh, this church is riding the beast, working together. Listen, the church of Rome has a unique way of capitalizing and bending to political opportunity. They always have. It's why they're filthy, filthy, filthy rich. They're very, very, very wealthy. You know, Italy's one of the most secular countries in the world. Everybody's Catholic. Nobody, nobody's devout. Nobody's saved. I'm telling you, we would, we would go to Italy and we would meet all these people and they're all Catholic. They're all Catholic. Not a one has a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's very strange, very religious, but there's no faith. It's a very secular place. Most of Europe is. Most of Europe is. So the fourth point is the Bible says there will be this prominent, powerful church over the European superpower working together. 
And I, again, it's not so that we can be afraid, but it's so we can pay attention. Because we see these things and we need to get busy and we need to draw people to Jesus while there's still time. That's what it all boils down to. All of this boils down to that. All of this boils down to, wow, what the word of God said was going to happen is happening and that makes me want to draw people to Jesus. That's what this is. Every bit of this is about that. Honoring Christ and bringing as many people to salvation as we possibly can. And things do seem to be getting bad. They do. They do seem to be getting a little bleak, right? It's a little depressing uh, if you let it. But as Christians, we shouldn't be worried. We shouldn't be worried. And I'm closing with this. Revelations 1 7 says this Look, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. You can argue as much as you want. You can argue all you want. The time is coming where everyone will see him come back. I saw this super, super cheesy video. I almost showed it and thought, that is too corny for words. I can't do it. But the video was sort of this picture. <laughs> it was really, really badly made. I got to show it to you just for, just for um, entertainment value. But what it showed was this family and this little girl. Look, mommy, Jesus. It was really, really badly made. But it was true in that it showed different countries. You could tell it was the same room. They changed a few props. They never moved the one coffee maker. It was there through all the different countries. So, but the point was, all over the world, they're going to see Jesus come back. They're going to see it. Well, how's that even possible? Listen, I don't know exactly what it's going to be like. I don't know exactly what he's going to do. But I do know that media has an eye all over the planet. There's, n there's nowhere to hide. N nowhere. You know? He could come at any moment, and the signs that are warning us of that are, are getting more and more. And that's good. It's not bad. It's good. It shouldn't, shouldn't make you nervous. It shouldn't make you strained and upset and angry. No, it should, it should make you happy. John chapter 9 verse 4 says this, As long as it is day, we must do what? The work of him who sent me. What do you mean, as long as it is day? Well, the day's ending. The day's going to end. I want to be ready. I want to be busy. Don't you? That's it. This is the whole, this is today's message. I, it, next week we'll look at a couple, no, actually, actually very excited about next week. Next week we have uh, Brother Coletti. Pastor Carl Coletti will be here next week to share, and it'll be on the same topic, except I've asked him to, to talk about something a little different. And so he'll be here next week. If you, if you know Brother Coletti, please by all means be here. If you don't, he's a fantastic guy, a great speaker, very lovable, my, one of my mentors, uh, probably the, the, the best mentor I've ever had. And, um, and he's also retiring, so we want to do something special for him. Um, so we're going to give him a little gift or something. And I just, I want to encourage you, don't miss next week. It'll be, it'll be really good. But anyway, getting back to, back to this, I, there's, there's an urgency that tells me that Jesus is coming back. And I, re I really, I want to get busy. Listen, <clears throat> it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that you can't do other things and you can't raise your children and have life and, and, you know, pursue the work that God's given you to do. But everything we do with one thought in the back of your mind thinking, Lord, am I doing what you've asked me to do? Am I drawing other people towards Christ? Am I drawing other people towards Jesus? Because that's what it's all about. It really is. In the end, that's what it's all about. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. And we'll end with this. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. That's it. That's what's going to happen. That's, you know, all, all, the, all the posturing, all the politics, all, everything else I've talked about today, everything else that's going to go on, none of it matters near as much as what God is doing. Because God doesn't, God's going to let that happen. He's going to let them do what they're going to do. And in the end, he knows his plan. And his plan is to take as many people home as he possibly can. That's the plan. And so we, when, when all nations have heard the word of God, then the end will come. Now again, years ago, that was really hard, hard to think about. How in, the world, how in the world would you tell somebody in the middle of, you know, uh, wherever, South Africa or somewhere in the, in the Congo, how in the world will everybody, listen, there have been missionaries that have, have gone into some of the most forbidding places you've ever heard of. They get there, the people don't, you know, they don't wear clothes, they're savages, whatever, what, they're na whatever you want to call them, call them. Someone has an iPod. I'm telling you, I'm not kidding. So they, there's missionaries, they've, they've gone to the most remote, crazy places in the world, someone's got an iPad, someone's got a computer and a generator. I'm not kidding. The time is on us where the entire world can literally know what's happening. And we'll hear the gospel. And that's what this is all about. Amen. Can you stand? I just want to take a moment and pray. <coughs> we want to, we want, <coughs> excuse me, we want to pray. 
we want to pray that the word of God would, would, would flourish in us, right? Because the, the, nothing of what we're saying here today really matters. If it doesn't get your juices flowing, if it doesn't get you moving and, and motivated, if it doesn't make you say, yeah, you know what? It's true. It's true. I'm living, I'm living for, for these little 50, 60, 70, 80 years I have now as if it's an eternity. The problem is this is going to go by like a drop in the bucket and, and eternity will never end. So do you want to live for the drop in the bucket or do you want to live as if eternity matters? I think eternity matters a little bit more, don't you? Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you that um, there are learned people and pastors and preachers and scholars and others certainly understand way more than I do. And we thank you for that. And we thank you for the wisdom that you give us. But God... Beyond all that, I ask that your Holy Spirit would quicken this word to our heart. Your word does not return void. It swells, it grows, it gives insight and its discernment. And, and God, that's what we ask for. We do ask for that wisdom to understand. God, I pray that you'd give us a hunger to eat the word of God, to devour it, cover to cover, and understand what it is you said. And, but for the for the purpose of drawing people to you. I pray that all of this would not discourage us or, or upset us in any way. And we're not to offend anyone. We're not looking to hurt anybody's feeling. But I pray that you'd open our eyes and allow us to understand what we're reading in black and white, that our heart would be stirred up and that we would be able to point uh, people in the direction of salvation, of peace, of an, of an eternity with a loving God that we would spare them from uh, an eternal torment instead. We love you. We thank you in advance for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you today. We're going to play something in the back here. If you want to pray or spend some time, please, by all means, memorial service this Wednesday, and we'll see you next Sunday.